everybody, and welcome back to my Zero Carb Life. I am joined today with Amy Berger, and I'm so thrilled to finally talk to her. We've talked on the phone, we've messaged each other a lot, and we were actually going to get together for lunch today until we both realized, even though we're both in North Carolina, that's a really long drive for us. <laughs> So we decided to just Zoom instead. Amy has written three books, The All-Timer Anecdote, End Your Carb Confusion, which she wrote with Dr. Eric Westman, and The Stall Slayer. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I was just um, just telling you offline, so to speak, how long I've been stalking you on Instagram before we ever started talking. I've been following you for a really long time. I read every tweet that you post because I get notified and I'm always thrilled to hear from you. And the main reason I have loved you for a couple of years now is that you are like the keep it simple girl of the keto world that just love your approach. In fact, one of the things you said is success is more important than perfection. There has yet to be a randomized clinical trial proving that filet mignon from a grass-fed steer raises blood sugar any less than a fast food hamburger patty without the bun. And you know, I love that. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's something in, in that book and your carb confusion that I did with Dr. Westman. We don't fear monger about the food provenance stuff. And it's, you know, I've worked at local farms. Do you know the town of Eflin, North Carolina? I've only I, heard of it, but I haven't been there. It's a tiny little town. And, but I, I recently, um, I, I just left the farm, but I worked there for over a year. I've worked at farms. I'm totally supportive of that kind of agriculture, yes. but that food is expensive. Yeah. And if we're going to tell people that you have to eat pastured pork and, you know, pasture raised poultry and the, the grass finished beef, we're automatically excluding millions of people who can't yeah. afford it. And um, we're just not going to do that because there's no evidence that that food is going to reverse your type 2 diabetes any better than regular meat from the supermarket. And Dr. Westman has been in a clinic treating patients for 20 years with this. And some of his patients, they are not financially well off, let's say, like they, they need to go to Walmart and get that big tube of beef and they do yeah. just as well as everybody else. Yes. Do you know Brett Lloyd? He's known as the thankful carnival. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. He goes and he buys those as well. And he makes no bones about it. He says, I buy the cheapest beef he can get. And he buys cheap bacon. Yeah. And that guy has changed his entire life. And yeah, he did it in the cheapest way possible. And honestly, most of my 11 years of carnivore has been spent eating the cheapest burger patties I could find. Yeah. And, and yeah, to be clear, like I fully encourage people buying from local farmers, keep, keep yes. your dollars local, support that kind of food if you yeah. can, but yeah. if you can't afford that, that should not be an obstacle to you getting healthy and losing weight right. and, and reversing your chronic health condition. Like that should not be a roadblock to you benefiting from this awesome way of eating, whether we're talking about keto or carnivore or whatever. Yes. And I have bought local cow here in my town. Excellent. Like you say, it's a great thing to do. It supported him. McDonald's needs my support a lot less than this guy. I wanted to have you here to talk about a subject that I think a lot of people are still pretty confused on. And I'm going to admit that I pretend to understand it better than I really do. We throw around the term insulin resistant. We'll say, oh, I'm insulin resistant. She's insulin resistant. We're all insulin resistant without fully understanding what that means. And I know there are some of you out there watching who are like, oh, please, you listen to a million things on this and you fully get it. But a lot of us don't. So start from basic and walk us through. I want to know what it is, how we get that way. How do we fix it? I've got some questions, Amy, but start from the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're you're definitely not the only one. This is a phrase that gets bounced around all the time. And I think if you ask people, well, what is that? Then they, they look at you like a deer in headlights, like they don't yeah. know. And yet they've been dropping this phrase all the time. Yeah. Okay. I don't like the phrase insulin resistance. And it's exactly because of this reason. What does it mean? Like what, if you ask 10 different people to define it, you get 10 different answers and 10 different pieces of advice on what to do about it. I prefer to use the phrase chronic hyperinsulinemia, which okay. the definition of that is built right into those words. Chronic meaning like all the time or recurring, coming back, hyperinsulinemia. 
hyper high insulin emia in the blood. Your, the insulin in your blood is too high too often. The definition is right there. So then the solution is also built right in, oh, my insulin is too high too often. The solution is to lower my insulin. Now there's a lot of different ways that you can lower insulin, but at least we can agree that that's what we need to do. We need to get the insulin down. The way that we all like to do it is by avoiding foods that tend to raise insulin the most. And those are gonna be carbs for the most part, refined carbs, especially Um, protein, affects insulin a little bit, but nowhere near like carbs. And it's, um, without going down that little rabbit hole too far, that's not a reason to avoid protein or beer. I mean, Ben Bickman, thank goodness, has covered this so well. Like the fact that protein, I I say, affects insulin. I I never use the S word spike. I hate that word. Protein spikes insulin. No, it doesn't. It induces a totally normal expected physiological effect on insulin. So um, I don't even, you know, to diagnose insulin resistance to me or chronic hyperinsulinemia, mm-hmm. it's basically metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome used to be called insulin resistance syndrome. And I don't know why they don't call it that anymore, but people need to kind of understand we, we hear insulin and we probably automatically think blood sugar. Yeah. Everybody knows of insulin as a blood sugar hormone, except lowering blood sugar is one of like 800 other things that insulin does. And so there's millions of people, and that's not an exaggeration, millions of people who have totally normal blood sugar, but really, really high insulin. And so maybe you have all kinds of weird, unexplained health problems and your doctor's like, well, you're not diabetic. You're not even overweight. You could be at a normal weight. And I don't know, see you in six months. And that's crap because you're walking away with no answers to your problem. And, and, and so many of these people have the normal fasting glucose or even sometimes a normal A1C because that really high insulin is keeping it in check. But The, the high insulin is, even, even when your blood sugar is normal and even when you're not overweight or obese, the high insulin is causing all this other stuff. The, all, all the, like, like, you know, from your history, all the hormonal imbalances in PCOS can be explained by the effect of insulin on so many other different hormones, including testosterone, progesterone, you know, follicle stimulate, all the hormones involved in the menstrual cycle. Um, hypertension, gout, um, skin tags, like so many things that we would not associate with insulin. And it's, it's every bit to do with insulin. I think an area of controversy now, what's causing the chronically high insulin, because if that's the issue, and, and I'm guilty of this, I've given presentations where I've said, oh, the, the chronically high insulin is the cause of X and Y and Z health problems. But what's causing the high insulin. We have to constantly be digging down. What is the ultimate final root cause of the problem? And it looks like it is a buildup fat in the liver and pancreas, like in and around the organs that regulate blood sugar. And this is why you can have all of these medical uh, metabolic problems at any weight. This people really need to understand, you know, we live in such a size biased society, but this has nothing to do with being overweight or, or having obesity. You can have all of these same problems being in a much smaller body. And it's because, you know, some people can fatten really easily. Let's say it's a, if, if you're storing a lot of excess fat in, in subcutaneous, meaning under your skin, in, in your arms, your legs, your hips, your thighs, the fat stored there is more benign, so to speak. It's not interfering with your metabolic health. Okay. Once you, it, there's a theory called the, the concept of the personal fat threshold that we all yeah. have kind of a genetically determined limit as to how much of this fat we can store in these parts of our bodies. Once that threshold is reached, we can't store any more fat here. The body has no place else to put excess energy coming in. It's going to shove it anywhere it can, inside your muscles, in and around those organs. Insulin, like I said, it has a lot of jobs. In addition to bringing down the blood sugar, 
it signals the fed state. It kind of keeps everything in. It keeps fat in the fat cells, keeps glucose in the liver. You know, it keeps, it, it's kind of like holding the dam, like holding the tide back. So when, when fat starts to build up in these organs, it takes, I think, more and more insulin to hold this fat in. And so I think that's what's causing that insulin to rise. If you have a very high personal fat storage capacity, you can be someone who is two or three or 400 pounds, but you do not have type two diabetes. You don't have hypertension. You ha you're metabolically on the inside, you're healthy. And then there's people, if you have a very low fat storage capacity in, yeah. in these other parts of your body, you're going to reach that, that limit very quickly. And then more of that fat is going to go into your organs at a lower body weight. These are the people it's, it's kind of a crass term, but it, we call it TOFI, thin outside fat inside. Oh. Or it's, in, in, the, in the scientific literature, they call it normal weight obesity, meaning oh. you have all of that we associate with obesity, even though you're a slender person. And then the opposite of that, the people that are very, very large, but are totally healthy on the inside, medically, they call those um, metabolically healthy obese. Okay. So like, I, I, I'm constantly on this point that we can't judge anybody by weight. Looking at somebody's size, you have no idea about their health. Okay. That is a point that I, I don't hear said very often that's it, a, it's not said enough i don't no. think because there's that diabetes right like obesity and type 2 diabetes go hand in hand so often that they yes. have that phrase diabetes but what about all the people that are not overweight that have raging type 2 diabetes so if someone suspects that they are hyper insulinemic slash insulin resistant how would they know for sure if you can't base it on a scale how would you know yeah, good question. You can get your fasting insulin level tested just like a fasting blood sugar. And so that's one way to tell. And the, the normal reference range though, most labs will tell you that anything under 20 or 25, and I think in the US it's micro international units per liter or per milliliter, yeah. I forget the exact thing. Most of us in the keto and carnivore and low carb world think that that is way too high. Yes. If you're in the double digits fasting insulin, you're already in trouble. So okay. we like to see it under 10, under five might be even better. But before people freak out, I always have to point out that I don't want anyone to become worried over one number in isolation. Okay. If you have been doing a low carb or carnivore diet for a while and your fasting insulin is 10 or 11 or 12, that doesn't automatically worry me. I want to see everything else. What does the total picture look like? Because, you know, we all know there's people um, who do low carb or carnivore ketogenic diets who have a slightly elevated fasting blood sugar. And that doesn't really worry us anymore for a lot of different reasons. And I think the same could possibly be said about insulin. I think there's a lot of reasons why insulin could be a little bit elevated and it's not a reason for concern. Now, the, the fasting level is important, but I'm, I'm more concerned with how much insulin are, are you secreting after a meal? And even more than that, how long does it take to come back to normal? Because this is something that we look at with blood sugar too. So many people's fasting glucose is normal, but uh -huh. if they eat a meal, especially a high carb meal, it's going through the roof and it maybe takes three or four hours to come back to normal. So the same thing can happen with insulin and you can get that tested. So you, you've heard of the oral glucose tolerance test, right? Yes. So they can do that, but instead of only testing your glucose, they can test insulin at the same time. Yeah. So but I don't, I don't recommend that because why would I recommend someone drink the glucose and to, don't, yeah. don't bother with that. Okay. I think a lot of indirect ways that you can assume that you have chronically high insulin. And some of the ways are, if you have high blood pressure, it really doesn't have, in most people, it doesn't have anything to do with your sodium or salt intake. It has everything to do with chronically high insulin. Um, okay. If you have a lot of skin tags, if, if you have PCOS, I mean that you can take that to the bank that you have okay. chronically high insulin, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 
Um, some people with migraines have chronically high, uh, uh. a lot of different things can trigger migraines, but, but the insulin is, is a big one, a large waist circumference. Like, so, so the, the, the diagnostic criteria, we said metabolic syndrome used yeah. to be called insulin resistance syndrome. Yeah. Um, the large waist circumference, um, especially in the men, if you, you see all these men that kind of are buff, they've got strong arms and legs, but they look like they've got a beach ball in their tummy. Yes. That's, you know, William Davis wrote the book. He called it a wheat belly. Some doctors call it an insulin pouch. Um, oh. So that's the, the extended belly um, hypertension, the dyslipidemia, so high triglycerides and low HDL, um, except I have come to learn, see, I learn new stuff about this all the time. In African-American people, they tend not to have the dyslipidemia. They can have raging metabolic syndrome, but they tend to just genetically or what, whatever their constitution, they um, tend to have lower triglycerides and normal HDL. So there are certain things in different um, ethnicities and people of different geographic origins that yeah. there are genetic differences. Okay. So um, I, I also think, and, and you and I know this only too well from our own personal histories, if you have tried a low fat diet and tons and tons of exercise and you can't lose weight no matter what you're doing, you are probably really, you know, intolerant to carbs and you might be swimming in insulin because we okay. said insulin has so many jobs. What, one of the things insulin does is it inhibits lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat. And if you want to burn fat, burn your stored body fat, it has to come out of the fat cell to be burned somewhere. And insulin is like, I, I, I make the analogy, it's like a security guard that stands outside the fat cell and doesn't let fat escape. So if you wanna be able to burn fat, you've gotta get insulin out of the way. And this, you know, you and I, how many years did I spend working out on the treadmill, on the bike? And, and then after my workout, I would eat a granola bar or have some carbs because I got to yeah. replenish that glycogen. And I had no idea I was constantly sabotaging myself. I was keeping myself in carb burning mode. Yeah, I was never, I was, I was eating carbs and burning the carbs and refueling with carbs. When did I ever get to burning fat? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was there. Exactly there. All right. So why do you hate the term insulin resistance so much? Okay. So it's because when you look at what's going on in the cells, uh -huh. they are not resistant to insulin. These cells are doing exactly what you would expect them to do under the influence of insulin. So for example, okay. one of the reasons insulin, um, chronic, high insulin is related to high blood pressure is that insulin causes your body to retain more sodium. So I said, it's not really about the sodium you're eating. It's the fact that your body's not able to get rid of it. And so, you know, when you're retaining more sodium, your blood pressure will go up. Insulin also um, stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, which is going to constrict your blood vessels. So now you've got high blood pressure. So if these cells were resistant to insulin, if they were resistant, they would be ignoring insulin. They'd be resisting. They'd be acting as if it wasn't there. So you wouldn't have high blood pressure. Okay. But you do. Same thing with gout. Gout is caused by a buildup of something called uric acid that accumulates in joints and forms these crystals. And that's what's responsible for the pain that you have in gout. High insulin makes your body hold on to the uric acid. So if your body was resistant to insulin, you wouldn't be retaining the uric acid. You wouldn't have gout. You would be losing weight. It would be easy yeah. to lose weight. Like look at a type one diabetic that makes no insulin. Yes. They hemorrhage fat. That's why they have to, they, it, insulin saves their lives. I mean, I don't want yeah. to bad mouth insulin. I mean, it's, a, it's an essential hormone, right? Right. Um, what we don't want is to, we don't want to be swimming in insulin all the time. We want just enough to do what it needs to do. If our cells were resisting insulin, they, they were acting as if it wasn't there, fat would be coming out of the fat cells all the time. Okay. So I, I like this, I don't like insulin resistance because these cells are not resisting insulin at all. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to do when insulin is there. 
That's interesting. That reminds me of Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. She hates the term autoimmune disorder because she says that your body is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It, that term to her implies that your nerve, that your immune system has malfunctioned. There's a disorder here. She says, no, your gut is leaking something into the body and your body is doing exactly what it's supposed to do by fighting. But you're right. This term also to me, because I have not spent large amounts of time on the topic of insulin resistance, other than just how to fix it, right? That's all I've really talked about with people is like, how do we fix it? which we're going to get to. But as for what it really was, I hadn't thought about that. No, your cells aren't resisting the insulin. They're responding to it. Exactly. And this is the crazy thing. This is why, you know, carb tolerance really is a spectrum. And there are people, we all know people that can eat carbs and they're lean, they're healthy, they're fit. And it's great, you know? Yeah. But two people can eat the exact same food in the exact same amount. And one person's insulin does this and the other person's insulin does this. Okay. So it's, you know, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, I'm sure, but it's a, it's a very individualized response. And I mean, as a general rule, I think drinking, you know, a glass of orange juice, more people are going to have that high response than not. But um, they did a study in Israel a few years back. I, I don't remember if they looked at insulin. I know they looked at blood glucose okay. and they did exactly with thousands of people. They gave them multiple different foods and um, testing each one. People's blood glucose response was radically different. Like they would like compare, let's say a piece of whole wheat bread, which we know is not as low glycemic as people think it is. Right. But compare something like a piece of whole wheat bread to a cookie, like a chocolate chip cookie. Okay. And some people would eat the chocolate chip cookie and the blood sugar, you know, skyrockets, of course. Some people would eat the cookie and the glucose barely moves. And then with the, you know, with the whole wheat bread or something higher in fiber or something, same thing, some somebody you would expect to have no response. And it it does so. Is there a way to change that? Or is it just sort of, you are who you are? I've tested my own blood sugar enough, even with very tame, low carb items like peanuts and sugar-free candies with like xylitol and stuff. Back when I used to eat those things, I was very into pricking my finger a million times a day. This was about 13 years ago. And it would go up every time. That's how I eventually was like, oh, well, the only thing that doesn't do that to me is meat. All right, that's what sort of brought me here. Uh -huh. But is that just sort of always going to be who I am? No, I think you can change it because, I mean, look at all the people now who had really, really severe health issues, really severe diabetes, um, you know, you know, very morbid, morbid obesity, and they did keto for a while. And now they're on more of a less extreme keto. They've okay. kind of reintroduced some carbs. They're not eating a high carb diet, but they're yeah. not crazy ultra strict keto and they're doing just as well. So okay. I do think after some period of time being strict, like clear that fat out, get the fat out yeah. of the liver, get it out of the pancreas um, and even lose, lose a little bit of the body fat storage because then when you eat, that stuff has somewhere to go. Yeah. Before, you know, if you get under that fat storage threshold, now it's got somewhere to go and it's not going to affect you metabolically. Um, All right, everybody. I have moved to my basement because we were having some internet issues. My laptop did not like sitting on the deck as much as I did. So what I was just telling you, Amy, was when I wore the CGM for two weeks and I love that thing, boring data or not, I loved it. Um, the only thing that caused my blood sugar to go up more than literally five points was a spoonful of honey and I wasn't terribly surprised by that because it was the first thing I have tasted in 11 years that even had a sweet taste other than just the slight sweetness of heavy cream which to me does taste sweet now um, heavy cream did not cause any impact on my blood sugar but honey did so thinking too with you I'm going to be wearing the CGM again does it matter? Is it pretty important that your blood sugar stays stable in the realm of insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia? Um, that's a good question. And I, I want to say no, only because people have some very binary thinking, very black and white thinking like, oh, if my, my blood sugar is high or this, 
if you're afraid of having high blood sugar on a low carb or carnivore diet, never, ever, ever do an intense workout ever because right. your blood sugar is going to rise. Like, sorry, that's, but guess what? That's your body doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Like, like, like Dr. Natasha, right. I'll have people email me. I, I did a three day fast and then I did a high intensity workout and my blood sugar skyrocketed to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, congratulations, you're perfectly healthy. Great. Right. <laughs> um, people, people need to understand that there are things that raise your blood sugar. Now, if it's being raised all the time, you know, three, four, yeah. 10 times a day by what you're eating and it's staying high, that's a problem. But right. every now and then, I, I don't think it's a problem, um, de 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 depending on the context. Okay. You know what? I have never once tested my ketone levels. Really? Never, never. But wait, wait, Kelly, how did, how did you lose weight without measuring your ketones? It's, it's amazing, right? How I did know. you how did you reverse PCOS? How did you how did you get healthy without knowing what your ketone level was? I know. And Amy, I'm going to test them soon because and somebody said, "Are you having problems?" Like, "No, I'm not. I'm just I'm trying to learn." This has been such a year of learning for me. I'm learning today. I want to know. I've been throwing around this term insulin resistance. What am I even talking about? I want to learn. And part of that for me is I want to learn what do ketone levels look like in a long-term carnivore? And does it matter? I don't know. We hear things, you know, sort of like LDL. We were all taught that it mattered so much. And now we're all like, eh, does it actually matter? As for whether or not I have ever a day in my life been in ketosis, I would just be guessing that yes, at some point I probably was. <laughs> I feel very good. I have lost weight. I have lots of energy. I don't eat carbs. I eat lots of fat. So I'm assuming there's been some ketosis involved. But I want to see what that looks like. So um, Keto Mojo meter, they're mm -hmm. going to send me one of those. Okay. Um, yeah, should be here in a few days, but I'm mostly just curious. Yeah. How much does that matter to you, you think? Um, to me, not really at all. But okay. it's so here's like people really need to understand that the reason these ways of eating work and by work, I mean, help you to lose body fat or bring your, you know, reverse your diabetes, reverse PCOS is not because of your ketones. It's because of having lower blood sugar and lower insulin. Okay. And, um, you know, when Dr. Atkins wrote in 1972 was Dr. Atkins' first book. Wow. And at that time, I think you could buy the urine test strips, but there were no blood ketone meters. There were no breath meters. And right. somehow people managed to lose weight. Somehow yeah. people managed to reverse their diabetes without ever measuring a single ketone. And you know, <laughs> like, Dr. Atkins did not invent the low carb diet. This is hundreds of years old. So it's like, you didn't need any of this technology to, to be successful. And so, and you know, Dr. Finney and Dr. Volick, who like we totally respect, yeah. they, they were kind of the proponents of saying that the range for nutritional ketosis is, is at least a blood of, of the beta hydroxybutyrate okay. 0 0.5 to five or so. Okay. And even they have backtracked a little bit on that because they're, they're in the Verta company out with testing all the, you know about Verta? So they're, no. they're Oh, they're part of a company that it's like a startup company that's basically reversing diabetes left and right okay. through low carb diet and remote monitoring with meters and stuff. And they're finding that people, you can do very well with a lower ketone level. Like you don't have to be at 0 0.5. And there's really no, um, most people are hardly ever in ketosis at all. Every now and then you would, even on a high carb diet, every now and then people will dip in and out of ketosis. Okay. But for the most part, you know, because people will test and they'll, they'll write to me, why are my ketones only 0 0.2? Or they'll say, I'm not in ketosis. It's only 0 0.3. And I'm like, you are in ketosis. Like you don't have to be at 0 0.5. That's, that's an, that's not a hard and fast rule. If okay. there's any measurable ketone at all, you are in ketosis. And um, yeah, people just need to know that the effects of the metabolic effects of this diet do not really come from the ketones. They come from the lower blood sugar and lower insulin. But the, what, the exception to that rule is that people who use 
a carnivore or ketogenic way of eating for mental health issues for bipolar, schizophrenia, anxiety. Sometimes those people do respond to the, the ketones themselves because they're so important for the brain. Okay. There might be conditions and people for whom the ketone level does matter because the ketones themselves are playing a role there. But if you're in this mostly for fat loss or, or reversing, you know, a metabolic issue, you, you don't need to measure your ketones. You can, okay. but do not think, and I'm not talking to you, I'm talking like to the general. Yeah, doctor. just in general, yeah. right. Don't think that having a higher ketone level is going to be better or like keep ketones don't cause fat loss. Ketones are the result of breaking down fat. So it's not like, oh, if I can just get my ketone level higher, then I'll lose more weight or that. No, it's like, if I can just burn more fat, then my ketone level will be higher. Okay. If you're happy with how you feel and how you look and your energy and all that stuff, who cares what your ketone level is? Why, why do you even care? Yes. But I think, I, I think it's totally fine if you want to measure because, you know, you are one of the few people, is one of the few people that I see online in this community who can take it as just numbers and data. You're not going to freak out about it. You're not no. going to change your whole life to revolve around. You're just going to be like, oh, that's interesting. Look at that. And, and here's the thing too. I, I don't want to get too geeky on the biochemistry, but you can absolutely have a fat-based metabolism and be burning fat without having high ketones. Because okay. if, you know any, any biochem textbook, when they talk about ketones and ketosis, they will always use this phrase. Ketones are the byproduct of the incomplete oxidation of fatty acids. Okay. Incomplete ox. So when you're burning fat, you know that you've heard of the Krebs cycle or the yes. how we make ATP. Literally inside your cell, when you make energy, it goes to this little cycle. And so if the fat, the fatty acid, is fully going through that cycle, then you don't have a whole. You don't have ketones being built up because you're com you are completely burning the fat. If you're not completely burning the fat, some of the little fat particles break off and get converted into ketones. And it's okay. neither good nor bad. There's no like better or worse. It's just the state of the body. And I think a lot of the carnivores tend to have lower ketone levels. Yeah. Clearly you are still, you have a fat-based metabolism. You don't eat any carbs. What the heck is your body burning if not fat? So- right regardless of your key, you, you clearly are burning fat. There's nothing else yeah. for you to be burning. You're not eating any carbohydrate. So when fats go through this cycle, and I'm trying to like keep it kind of basic so people understand. Thank you. <laughs> when you go through this cycle, um, it there's pieces out that have to merge in order to keep the cycle going. And okay. some of those pieces can come from protein. So as, as long as you're not skimping on protein, if you're eating enough protein, which most people on the carnivore diet are, you're going to have enough of those bits to keep the cycle going and you will be able to completely use those fats. Okay, man, I love your approach to thing. All right, so in the terms of insulin resistance, something I've been curious about I, I had a talk with Dr. Robert Savas. I love that guy too. He said he would like for me to get my in fasting insulin checked. He said, have you had your fasting insulin done? I said, I'll go look. I looked through a stack of blood work. Never. It had never been checked. Right. And he said, yeah, you need to get that and your C-peptides. I'd like to look at those two numbers. I think those are really good data. And so I went and had it checked and my fasting insulin was 2.8. And at that point, that meant nothing to me. So I, on the chat with him, I said, okay, well, I had it done and told him what it was. He said, that's great. Okay. We didn't get into why that's great. So you're saying that for someone who is carnivore a long time, you would not be surprised at all to see it five or less, correct? Right. Okay. But if it's not, there you don't see any reason over that one number to just freak out and deem yourself as still insulin resistant first of all if you don't have a starting point you don't know whether to, that could be a huge you know if you're at a seven that might be half of what it was before you started doing keto or carnivore right 
Yes, and that that's such a good point. I mean, if if you don't have anything to compare it to, maybe it used to be forty, and now yeah. it's fifteen, and that's a huge improvement. Right. Yeah. And I had nothing to compare mine to. I am going to assume that when I was obese and I did have a lot of skin tags, even my twenties, and lots of inflammation, signs and symptoms of inflammation, I'm going to assume that that number would have been higher than two point eight back then. <laughs> Yeah. Can it be too low? You think if you're on a low carb or, or, you know, carnivore ketogenic diet, I would say no. If you're not on one of these ways of eating, then the concern would be a type two diabetes situation. So can your insulin be too low? If your blood sugar is normal? No. If your blood sugar is very high? Yes. Okay. then I would, I would look into a possible, like, you know, maybe early stage of type one diabetes possible thing. Okay. So we've talked about all of these different tests that people use and all the symptoms that these issues can cause. And I don't think it's going to come to any surprise that for me, if somebody were to ask, well, how do I fix this? I would say cut out the carbs, (laughs) right? But tell people any further advice, how can they fix this? If they either suspect that their fasting insulin is high or that they are hyperinsulinemic slash have insulin resistance. They've got any of these symptoms. They're carrying weight here. They've got the skin tags. They feel like garbage. What do they need to do, Amy? I would say the same thing. Cut the carbs. Now that's, that's not the only way to improve this, but I think it's the fastest and it's the most effective. Any amount of fat loss will probably help because if it's a buildup of fat, you know, again, even if you're not overweight or obese, you still have excess fat. It's just in the wrong place. Um, So any, any way that you can get that fat out will help, but what, what is a way that you can do that? and not have to fast forever and ever and ever, you know, and eat, no matter how much you love fasting, at some point you have to eat food. Um, is there a way to do this where you don't have to white knuckle it? You don't have to like calorie count all day. You don't have to be hungry all day. You don't have to have willpower. Is there a way to do this where you could eat ribeye steaks and bacon? I just think that keto or carnivore or some variation of that is just the most effective. It's not the only way to do it. It's the most effective. Fasting has become so popular in the keto world, but it's not necessary. You know, Dr. Atkins never said a word about fasting. Um, Not that it can't be helpful, but by, by being on a very, very low carb or zero carb diet, you are already accomplishing most of what people fast for in the first place. What are you trying to do by fasting? Bring down the blood sugar, bring down the insulin, give your body a chance to heal, even autophagy. And I hate that word. It's like nails on a chalkboard. Fasting is not the only way to induce autophagy. Exercise induces autophagy. The state of ketosis itself upregulates autophagy. Of course, if you're eating a garbage diet, then- (laughs) Going a day or two here and there without eating garbage, of course, in the study, your health gets better. Yes. What we don't know is how much added benefit there is to fasting when you're already on a very low carb or zero carb diet. I would love to see that, especially say you take a very long time adapted carnivore who is not getting carbs from any other source, from any source, and then see if anything changes if they were to add in extended fasting or even alternate day or just some form of fasting people will say oh you can't get rid of loose skin without autophagy and you can't have autophagy without fasting and I'm like I don't know because I had a lot of loose skin and I never had it removed like it it went somewhere (laughs) and and I definitely have been eating now if people would prefer to get their results by skipping meals or days of meals, then it doesn't bother me whatsoever. But (laughs) it's just not my preferred, but I would just rather have steak or burger patties every day. I think intermittent fasting is fine. And I, I, so all these, so I was an English major. It's why I'm very hung up on the way that we phrase things and the words we use. I don't like intermittent fasting. I prefer the time restricted eating or something because to me, fasting implies the deliberate withholding of food. Like yes. you are, you're actually hungry, but you're not letting yourself eat. 
If yes. you're only having one or two meals a day because you're only hungry once or twice a day, that's not fasting. You're no. eating when you're hungry, which is what we should all be doing. Um, what, what, so that doesn't concern me. If you're only hungry for one big meal a day, have one big meal a day. I'm, I'm more concerned with the extended fasting. I think yes. that gets people into trouble. And like, like my, you know, Dr. Westman, my co-author, he's more concerned about the physical ramifications, but you, you and I, and what we see going on in the world with the keto and carnival world, yeah. I'm much more concerned about the mental uh -huh. and emotional yeah. damage that, that kind of getting a little too deep into that mindset, the, what that can do to the, the thinking about food. Now, I know that there are people who seem to have a very balanced mind around it, and that's just how they prefer it. And some of those same people would say to me, girl, I can't imagine eating burger patties every day. So that's, that's true. That's, yeah, I we get that. We have to acknowledge that. Yes. Different methods. That doesn't feel like punishment to me at all, but yeah. they would feel probably the same way about their fasting regimen. But no, that's, you know, we're all a little bit different in some ways. That's what I hear from you so often. And I hear that from people who read your books. They love this about you, Amy Berger, is that you let them know that there is, for many people, a lot of grace. Some of us have to be incredibly what some would call strict because of addiction and how we know how quickly, that's, that's me, even that one bite of honey triggered something in my head. And I know that is not for me. But you are so, um, you're so welcoming in the community of, look, you might be able to handle a lot of things that I can't handle. And I really do like that and that you keep it simple. And I hope that especially if somebody is um, eating a diet with carbs, that they will check out your books. And even if they are just looking for more clarity on actual insulin and how they can influence that more than just seriously cut out the carbs and eat some animals just do that right like step one get some animals and nothing else and you're going to automatically you are going to lower your fasting insulin score you are going to steady that blood sugar and you are probably going to see all of the symptoms that we call insulin resistant start to fade and I love that message that you put out there thank you Amy well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I, I love that you keep it simple too. And you know, Hey, just, what should I do? Just eat meat or just what? Meat. Just, just stop eating carbs. I mean, it's, yeah. it doesn't have to be rocket science. <laughs> right. But I love that. You know, the rocket science, you really do. I hope to have you back sometime soon. And in the meantime, we'll continue stalking each other. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Bye Amy. Bye.